What's up, everybody? Sam from HHG here, as usual, just working on some drums. So I don't know if anybody jumped in yesterday. I was making some, uh, making some, working on some custom lugs yesterday. And yesterday, what I did was took all these barrels for these lugs. They're just a uh, long steel tube plated in bronze. I drilled holes in the end of all of them. And now today, after drilling the number 16 holes, I have to come over here to this cool little device, this little uh, hand-powered tapping press. Pretty cool little unit. And I'm going to tap these holes and get them threaded so that a tension rod can fit in them. It's a, it's a tedious, tedious, awful process, and I've, I've done a bunch of them already. These ones are all, these are all done, and I've got about nine or ten left to do, which is really nice, because this shit sucks, and I'm looking forward to being done and putting these onto the drum set. That'll be nice. So these ones are done, and I'm just going to sit here for a while. Volume is way better. Good. Yes, I, I changed some things. The ever-evolving live stream. Welcome to my, welcome to my experiment. So. Let's tap some lugs, what do you say? Before we do that, I'm gonna grab a cup of coffee. We'll be right back. Swear to God, it's already ready. I'm just gonna go grab it. I'm gonna be right back. Okay, I'm back. So, I like doing these live streams while I do these uh, monotonous bullshit jobs. My usual go-to for shit like this is just a podcast. Something to occupy my mind a little bit. But the live stream thing is pretty fun too. Because I, I get to chat with you guys. And we can talk about drum shit. Yesterday was cool. Uh, yesterday was fun. Yeah, uh, What's his name? Bale stopped by. That guy's fucking awesome. Had a little chat with him. Uh, Grumpy Kitten, thank you. I'm glad to hear that the volume is better. It turned out there's a uh, a volume setting, like a slider, where you can turn the input volume up or down. And I was changing settings around, but I was neglecting the slider, so that was uh, that was the main issue. So the whole process here is basically you put the lug through a hole in the bottom of the press, add a little bit of oil to the end of the tap. And then just crank this thing down. This works really well because it keeps everything lined up. Gives you a good amount of leverage over the, um, the tapping process. But you can still, the difficult thing about tapping holes like this. These posts on Instagram, sparkle paint, the teal one. Oh my God. Do you mix that paint? I mix that paint myself, dude, every day. Randy, what's up, man? <laughs> the sexiness slide. Hey, you showed up. I saw your live stream yesterday, Randy. You're looking fucking beautiful these days with your beard all trimmed up. It's fucking awesome. Oh, Randy, and also I had some thoughts. I saw your video, and you were talking a little bit about like uh, Wi-Fi and like how you're using hotspot in your in your garage. There's no Josh. There's no particular. Re I'll get. Hold on, Randy. Hold that thought. I'll be right back to you, Josh. There's no particular reason why. I, chose to make these ones other than it was necessary. I don't usually make, you know, all of my lugs custom like this, but this kit was a very unique, very unique thing. And the, the lugs, if there was no way I was going to be able to, from my, you know, from some of my usual partners and CNC shops and metal shops, nobody was going to be able to do these for me. So I just decided to, Bite the bullet and just make them myself. The, I talked about this a little bit yesterday, but basically the, the kit, so it's a seven piece kit. I think, yeah. And every lug or every drum needed a different length of lug because the goal with the kit, uh, <laughs> you're funny, Randy. Um, basically every lug is going to be a different length. Because every drum is a different depth, and the goal was to keep the 
the reveal, if you will, the distance between the end of the lug and the bearing edge, the same on every drum. So that means every lug needed to be, not every lug, but every drum needed a set of lugs that were a custom length. So I had a bunch of these made in the two longest sizes I needed. And then what I had to do was take and cut from those longest ones, cut a bunch of them down to fit for some of the shorter sizes that I needed. But Randy, real quickly, if you're still here, you were talking about like Wi-Fi and hotspot. I just went through this, man. Um, I was having, Kevin will attest to this, it was awful. We had this like, I had this network of, I had like a router in my house and a Wi-Fi extender in my garage. And it was just like, it was always this terrible, like, you know, trying to keep this network patched together with the extender and the router. And I just, I finally, like one day I had had enough. I couldn't get it to reconnect no matter what the fuck I did. So I just bought like a hundred foot cat six cable and I plugged it into the local area network port of the back of my router. And then I got a fucking concrete chainsaw and I cut through, I cut into the dirt of my yard and just jammed that cable about six inches deep and ran it out to the garage. And so now it's hardwired and I'm in good shape. So I would recommend you do the same thing. Just go get yourself uh it doesn't need to be underground. Like I, I, I think you're um, all you need to do at that place. Cause you moved to your dad's old house, right? Randy, I think. And I've been there. Remember years ago when he was getting rid of some stuff, I stopped by and it's not far from the house. You could just, um, me, I gotta blow the chips out of this. I think what you could do is probably just run, run the, uh, the cable overhead, just like attach it to the siding on the garage and attach it to the house and just have it drooped between the two. I'm a network engineer by trade. Cables are, yes, fuck wireless, grumpy kitten, couldn't agree more. Oh, you have an underground conduit already, Randy. Well, you're ahead of the game. Because I, I did not have an underground conduit, unfortunately. So I had to go fucking caveman on it. But then also, on top of the fact that I was trying to use this, like, shitty wireless network, I also had, like, the worst cable or the worst possible internet package. The guy came to, like, so I upgraded my internet package, too. I think I had, like, five megabyte, five megabytes per second upload before, and now I have, like, 100. <laughs> the guy showed up, and he's like, I don't even know how this fucking modem is working anymore. It was like the oldest modem. It was a piece of garbage. I'm currently, I when I got that with Atlantic Broadband, they it came with, like, they provided a router, and they also provided, like, a, a Wi-Fi extender. And they're nice, but they, they charge you a rental fee. They charge you, th like, 13 bucks a month or some shit, and I am not cool with that, so I'm probably going to buy my own at some point. Need to run a snake with an alarm on the end so I can find out where the fuck. Yeah, the snake. I tried that. Hey, Joe, what's up? Joe Meckler's here, everybody. Joe Meckler, aka Joey Boom, my man. Always plugging the very fantastic Delaware Drum Show, February twenty seventh. I appreciate you, Joe, coming by and talking about that because I do a bad job. We'll definitely be posting about it once we hit February. But if anybody. If anybody is so inclined, the coolest drum show, in my opinion, of the entire year is happening February 27th in, uh, I forget where it's at. It's like Delaware-ish, or maybe it's in Pennsylvania, I forget. Joe, can you tell me where, where the fuck is that? Grumpy Kitten, you're, you're too, uh, you're too kind. Thank you. I, I'm a hack, really, but I'm trying my best. Okay, so that was one lug done. Let's do another one. What do you say? The key here is uh, Newcastle. Thank you. Newcastle, Delaware. The Nurse Shrine Center. I'm forgetting where the fuck it was. It's called the Delaware Drum Show, so you, I would assume it was in Delaware. But something you'll notice about me, Joe, is I'm dumb as a box of rocks. <laughs> 
the key, what I, what I found, I was initially trying to do this. I had a, a lathe chuck attached to this, and I was trying to grab the rod, and it was just spinning in the chuck. And then I remembered there's a through hole in the center of the barrel. And I was like, well, that'll stop it from rotating. So I got the through. I just got a, a steel pin, and I, I put it through the through hole in the center. And then that stops it from rotating. One of the difficult things about these live streams is like when I do these, I'm, I'm really like, I really enjoy chatting with you guys, but I'm also like, I have limited time. So I need to like try to remember to actually um, continue doing work. Like I could, I could probably sit here with a lug in my hand and just chat about Wi Fi and drum shows for several hours. Josh, Bobby, I appreciate that. There we go, Kevin. Kevin dropped it in the chat. The date, the time, the detail, all the stuff. Right now, we have about, uh, I think it's like 10 snare drum shells that are going to be, they're, they're finished. The drums are, they're finished other than the fact that we just need to put them together. <laughs> Crumpy kitten, you're too kind. You should totally order five snare. Don't you don't need the money to order five snare drums, Grumpy. You just need one. Start with one. Yeah, we we've got some cool stuff. We just I just posted it on Instagram the, the other day. It was like a picture of a uh, one of our storage shells over in the in Kevin's assembly shop, and it was like, see anything you're interested in? It was a bunch of finished finished drums, or you know, shells, finished shells ready to be assembled. Me and Kevin are working through the details right now of what we're going to do as far as hardware on all of those. Because it's important. I think it's important to pick the, the correct hardware for a drum. Ye old oil brush. When you're using a tap or a die, you cannot use too much lubricating oil. I might need to send you a message at some point. My dude, Josh, that would be really cool. I am swinging up to um, see my good friend Dan Stone uh, this weekend, Saturday, actually. If you guys are free, Saturday uh, we'll be live on Dan's Twitch channel. We're going to bring up some really cool drums, some snare drums, and a drum set for Dan to try out. Basically, I like to just go, like, Dan ordered two snare drums from us, and we're going to... Bring those up, and we're going to deliver those to him. But also, while we're there, we're going to demo some other drums for other customers. And uh, it's going to be a fun stream. I always have fun going up there. Kevin's coming with me this time. Um, it's, it's a good time. Dan is a really fantastic dude. I'm, he's such a nice guy, but also, I'm just also... The reason I'm streaming right now is because of him. Like, I'm so... His technical prowess not just in playing drums, but also like the art that is, you know, audio video capture of playing drums and streaming live. It's really fucking awesome. Like he suggested that I get this this program or this service that I'm using right now, this restream. Um, and it's fucking awesome. Because it, it allows me, it's a little pricey. I think it was like 160 bucks or something. Um, for the service for, for a year subscription. But it's really cool. It makes the whole live streaming thing much easier. Like you could, of course I could stream from Instagram or Facebook or any one of those individual platforms. But what I like about this restream thing is like you, you just log into restream by itself and then go live and it shoots that live feed to all of your socials all at the same time, which in the current climate of, you know, more content is better, you really can't beat the multiplication factor that you get from, you know, streaming to several different out, out, outputs kind of at the same time. So this is, after I do the, um, where is the camera? So after I do the initial tapping, I take an air gun. Watch your ears. Blow out. Yes. Get in there. You need to get out. 
And then after that, I take I have the same number 12, 24 tap in a drill. So what I like to do is I just like to run this drill in there a couple of times just to make sure that I get all the chips out, make sure that the uh, threads are clean. Because even one, even one little metal chip in there is enough. Uh, the program's called Restream. Uh, Mike Butler, what's up, man? Yeah, thanks. It's it's hard to work in talk. If you old, uh, if you got time to clean, if you got time to lean, you got time to clean things. <laughs> so yeah, you gotta. This part sucks because like you'll run this tap in there a couple of times, and every time you run it in there, there's a couple of chips that get made couple of chips to get cleaned out and then you gotta blow everything off and do it again. Like I was talking about yesterday, they make really awesome CNC machines that do this type of work. And if I had the space and if I had the money, I would fucking own one, but unfortunately I don't have the space or the money. I'm gonna turn off the heater because the heater is right above us right now. And it's loud as fuck, so I'm going to turn that off. Give me one sec. I try to keep it pretty toasty in the shop anyway, so it'll be a while before it cools down. I like to, I like to keep it about 70 degrees in here. Bales. So, power lines. As many of you, or maybe maybe nobody knows, because I don't fucking know. Um, this is not my full-time job, as is the same for my friend Bales over there. Um, as he would surely tell you, building drums does not pay the bills. It's, uh, if you're looking for a good money-making business, this is not the one. Um, but Bales, what I did was recently, let's say about, not recently, I could say about six months ago, maybe eight months at this point, uh... I switched my job <clears throat> at my, my day job. So my day job is I fix power lines. Like if you don't have electricity, uh, I come out and fix that shit. I work for Penelec. And I switched my job recently. I used to do like construction and maintenance. So I was, you know, Monday through Friday, 7 to 3, building and fixing power lines on a crew. And then recently they had this job come up. It was a troubleshooter job. And basically, I now my schedule changed. So now I work 4 p.m. to 2 a.m. And it's a, it's a really good gig for a lot of reasons. First and foremost, I get to keep my truck, my big, big ass bucket truck that I use for work. We'll talk about that deep ass tap. Oh yeah, Kevin, I, I did talk a little bit about the, the tapping jig, but I will, uh, I will certainly get into it a little bit. I'll, I'll run it over again. It's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, I, I started this new gig where I work 4 p.m. to 2 a.m. And then one of the biggest benefits is I get to keep my bucket truck at my house and I start and stop my work day at my house. So to answer your question, Bales, I don't have any power lines to fix right now. Because I don't have to go to work until 4 o'clock. It's fucking awesome. Now, working to 2 o'clock in the morning kind of sucks. But, you know, I've kind of got into a rhythm where I get about 6 hours of sleep, which seems to be perfect for me. Actually, it was, it was more than I was getting before when I had my old job. And so I, like I, you know, I go, go to sleep at 2. I wake up at like 8. And then I just, I've got my, my wife and my daughter, my wife's at work, my daughter's at school, or daycare, I guess, and uh, I've got, you know, from 8 o'clock to about 3.30 to build drums, and then I go to my day job, which is pretty awesome. I feel like I have more time now to build drums than I ever did before. It's much less stressful. I really dig it. I'd love to walk away from the day job, but... I think I'm a couple of years away from that. I think I've kind of run the numbers tangentially, and I'd probably have to get 
I'd probably have to get the drum business to do it about a million in revenue a year before I could entertain the idea of walking away from a full-time job. And uh, I think that that's possible, but a company that's making a million a year in revenue looks drastically different than what the drum company looks like now. Like we'd probably have to have at least three employees. You know, we're going to have to be in that new location, the new shop that we bought. So I, I got some time before I can entertain that. So there's more than you ever wanted to know, Bales, about the, um, the whole power line fixing situation. <laughs> Oh, how many we got left? I only have three of these left to do, which is really fucking fantastic. I can't describe to you how much I dislike this. It's not very fun. So after I tap the uh, tap the lug, I find that a couple of just letting it drop on this uh, cast iron base plate of this tapping machine works pretty well. Get a lot of the chips out. Hmm. What's the closest recorded snare you have to the 14 by 7 curly maple snare? Recorded snare. Uh. Um. I'm trying to think. That's a good question there, Mr. Grumpy Kitten. I'd have to, in all honesty, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the stave drums sound very similar. So if you go to our YouTube channel and check out just some of the 14x7 stave drums in general, uh, I think they'll, most of them will give you a good approximation of what a 14x7 curly maple would sound like. Which, which, uh, which drum are you referring to there, Grumpy Kitten? Are you talking about that, that blue and purple curly maple we have over in the shop that we posted the other day? Because realistically, I could just put it together for you and play it. Uh, that needs to probably just happen. Oh, yeah, the purple one. That one's fucking fantastic. That was, uh, that was a rare batch of curly maple that I got. I don't know why, but whenever I get, like, really interesting lighter colored woods, <clears throat> I always find myself gravitating to, like, blue and purple. Maybe it's because just historically that's what's sold well for me. It also might be a little bit of a personal bias. I just think it looks great. Nice, light, curly maple with either a deep blue or a purple. Can't beat it. Okay. There's another one. Dunzo. Randy, I don't know what that link is, but... I should make you one of whatever that YouTube video link is. <laughs> hmm. On a side note, Randy, I was just thinking about the other day. Do you remember, I don't know if you're still here or not, but do you remember years ago? I, I used to drag, for anybody else here, Randy Cervello is a local prolific drummer. And I used to always call Randy up and drag him to the most ridiculous locations to do drum demos. And I was thinking about Randy, do you remember some of the first ones we did where we went to that, like, brick building down in Altoona. It was, a, it was a music venue for a while, up on the fourth floor. And we, I fucking, we would drag a drum set to the top of this, like, abandoned brick warehouse. And I would just set up, like, a fucking, my DSLR, like a Zoom recorder for the audio, and we would just do demos like that. I wish I had more time to do shit like that, because those were, those were fucking fun. I really think going forward, what I'd like to do for, because it's something I've struggled with for a long time, is like, I get the question constantly, like, oh, those drums look cool, but like, how do they sound? And I, you know, I, I try to get some videos out here and there, but they're usually shit unless I hire somebody else to make them. Ah, the snake would, yeah, man, that one was fucking fantastic. I actually have a buttload of snake wood in the shop right now. Um, that shit is so expensive it's unbelievable what I was saying was like, it's, I think that eventually what I'd really like to do as far as like doing more drum demos so people can hear the drums that we build here is just do more of these live things but I'd like to figure out a way to do it I don't think it, 
you know, just a way to do it better than what I'm doing now. And, you know, Kevin's aware of my current efforts to, I'm slowly, that's, that's why I'm on here today, is I'm slowly trying to get more comfortable with, like, the live streaming thing, because it kind of fits my, like, ADHD mentality. Like, I really don't have the time to, like, sit down, mix and master, edit the video, blah, blah, blah. What I'd really love to do is get to a point where I could just set up a drum set or a snare drum and have a decent enough static setup with microphones and cameras that I could just set it up, go live, and have the audio and video quality be good enough that it would, you know, communicate to people the way a drum sounds without me having to spend an asinine amount of time <clears throat> making videos. Um, and the next step in my, like, improvement plan for that is... Like, I'm just, right now, I'm just streaming to you guys with my fucking cell phone. And that's, you know, that's passable for something like this. But that is certainly not going to be long-term a good solution for doing drum demos. So I got my Canon uh, T6i. I I just figured out how to use that as my live stream camera. I got that all hooked up and figured out. So that should be able to provide me with really good video quality. When I'm over in Kevin's shop. But the next step is audio quality, which is far and away a more difficult thing than the video. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I actually I messed around with that just a little bit last night. Because Randy, I think you have one of those XR18s, right? I, I that's I got one of those too. It's like a pretty inexpensive uh, Behringer mixer mixer doesn't it's not like a traditional mixer it's more of like a it's almost more of just a large interface board that allows you to kind of interface a bunch of you know microphones into a computer and i have uh oh is it ableton i have ableton as my daw and i just i i haven't fired up that xm so like over in the shop i i have you know, I have some microphones on the ceiling, and I got a snake, and I have a bunch of drum mics, and I have the XR18, like, the mixer permanently mounted to the wall. Like, I have the infrastructures there. I even have, like, LED lights and shit on the ceiling and the walls, so I can turn the, the shop lights out and, you know, put on some mood lighting for shooting videos. I kind of went down this path, like, a year or two ago, and my intention back then was to just really start to, like, record my own videos, and then I just, it became cumbersome and terrible and Short story long, I I haven't turned on that XR18 for at least a year. But I fired it back up last night, and I was playing with it a little bit. And that's going to be my next step, is figuring out how to get the XR18, get a good live mix out of that. You know, I'm going to run it into Ableton, do all my mixing in Ableton, uh, and then... Uh, use the the output like the send from Ableton as the audio for the live stream. That's a fucking it's a pain in the ass. It's just sitting down and like like I haven't even gotten to the point where I'm like hooking up microphones and shit. Like I just spent an hour last night just downloading drivers to try to get the XR talking to the Ableton. Not super fun, but necessary you can't you can't rightfully expect people to purchase a drum that they haven't heard before so it would certainly be easier if I was in my new shop if I had you know the new shop we got it's like 3300 square feet as opposed to this building is 900 and then our assembly shop is 300 it would be really nice to have some additional space as some of you may or may not be aware, I did have we had a fire down there. That kind of that kind of pushed back our move-in date to the new shop a little bit. Didn't burn the place to the ground, but it fucked it up good enough that I basically was forced to stop working on it. Right now, it's you know it's January in Pennsylvania, and the next thing I have to do down at that shop is to pressure wash everything. You're running straight out of the headphone directly into my camera. Oh, that's not a bad idea. Straight out of the headphone into the camera. 
Oh, headphone output out of the XRT. That's not a bad idea. Maybe I could do that. Yeah, that might work. Fuck, that might be way easier. Because there is like a microphone input. You mean, are you running, yeah, out of the microphone of the XR18 into the uh, camera input of your, whatever camera you're using. That would, I could probably just do that. That would probably fucking work. That, yeah, that, that sounds like a good solution to me. I might try that out. I mean, I guess otherwise. I guess, I mean, that's kind of where I'd end up anyways if I was doing it through Ableton. The only difference probably would be is I would just end up running a, a head, like a, you know, a headphone jack cable out of the computer to the camera. I was wondering, though, I think that actually, no, that's probably not what I would do. Because you can select your, your audio outputs on Restream. Probably what I would end up doing is taking the, uh, like, you can go to the Restream settings. And you can select your, you know, camera, what camera input you want to use, what audio input you want to use. And if I can get the XR18 to show up, or Ableton, for that matter, to show up as an input on the audio, then I can just select that and use that directly. So it's just feeding through the computer right to the live stream. I think, and then there's, I was just from Googling last night, there's some programs that are specifically meant for doing what I'm trying to do. They, they all seem to be free, if not cheap, so I don't know. Long-term goals. Because eventually, like, it, it would be nice if I could figure this out, this whole live stream with the super high-quality audio and the video. If I could get that figured out now. I literally just, yeah. Yeah, that's a good idea, Randy. That's, that's, the, that's probably the way to go. I have a really good habit of making things more complicated than they need to be. I'm very good at that. That's like, I was thinking if I could get this, you know, it's something I've been wanting to figure out for years. But if I could get a really good system set up <clears throat> for demoing, doing video demos of the drums that I'm building, then when I move to the new shop, it'll just be that much easier to basically just move the system down there. So I'm hoping that's something that'll work at some point. Kevin, you asked earlier about this tapping jig thing that I'm using. Let me talk a little bit about this, because it's fucking cool. Yeah. Yeah, I figured that's what I was thinking too, Randy. I was like, I might as well get the DAW involved early, because it's going to allow me more functionality as time goes on. Like, rather than just jacking straight out of the XR headphone jack, into the camera, if I could run it through DAW and then run it into the live stream program, <clears throat> that would give me the functionality to like play with a, bla a backing track, which I think, I, I personally, I really like drum demos when they play with a backing track. A lot of people don't like that. I do, I like to be able to hear a drum in context. I think that that is really helpful. Tappy, tappy, tappy. And, uh, so let's, let's, would you guys like to maybe chat about this beautiful thing? So I, I, I think, what is this called? Seriously, instructions. What do they call this thing? Is there a name for it? It's the Grizzly Model G8748 hand tapping machine. Point of view storage. I'm a big fan of keeping the instructions for complicated things right with them. So I put a zip tie in put the instructions in there. Um, but I bought this thing, I want to say like more than a year ago. It might have even been two years. I forget what project I was doing at the time, but I had just finished some project where I had to tap a bunch of holes by hand. I run the IE, I'm breaking the audio from it, and the X32 rack is dope. Yeah, I agree, Grumpy Kenneth. Yeah, I, I, Behringer, like, I'll come back to the tapping jig, but Behringer, like, in my mind, it always had the, the connotation, and it still kind of is. It's like the cheapest shit you could buy. It was like, you know, the real professional audio people would laugh at you if you said you're using marriage or shit. But, like, it's getting to the point anymore where, like, does it really fucking matter? Like, 
I'm sure that I could get a marginally better sound with, you know, some better preamps, and I'm going to spend a shitload of money on all these, all these microphones and, you know, rack gear and all this shit, but it's like, you got to you gotta really just look at, like, having something that's imperfect sometimes is better than having nothing. So that's, that's where the Behringer works very well for me. Yeah, I agree, Grumpy. That, that X30, the X32, is that like, or the XR32, is that just like, I have the XR18, and I, I would assume that the X32 is just the same thing, but with 32 inputs. For me, like, all I'm ever going to do is just, I'm only ever going to be recording a drum set, you know what I mean? So like, 18 inputs is absolutely enough for me. And they're pretty affordable, I think they're like 500 bucks, like, they're not terribly expensive. But yeah, this uh, this tapping machine, the Grizzly G4874 hand tapping machine. I really, I have an affinity for Grizzly tools. I know they're, you know, they're all made in Taiwan. And sometimes they're not the best quality in the world, and I'm sure I could, sure there's better, more expensive shit I could buy, but just like the Behringer thing, they seem to work for me. But I bought this thing. Uh, about two years ago, I had some project where I had to hand tap a bunch of holes and something. And the the alternative to using something like this is just doing it with a tap wrench, where you're just spinning it by hand. If anybody's ever done that, you know how awful it is. It's uh, really difficult to get the, the tap to go in straight, and it's you know you have the leverage is terrible and. The, usually the tap wrenches suck and they, they keep slipping on the tap. They're just sort of trash. So immediately, I got online and I was like, there has to be like a better option. They make, they, uh, I think it's called, they make this machine called a flex arm. It's like a hydraulic powered tapping machine. Oh, cool. Okay. Well, Grumpy, thank you for the input. I, one of those 32s, you're at least affirming to me that Behringer is, I, I didn't make a terrible decision. I'm glad I got that XR18. It seems to work for me, and I'm glad that 32 works for you. Um, but they make a machine called a flex arm, I think, or something. I think it's called a flex arm. And it's like an articulating arm with a hydraulic tapping motor on the end. And they're like $5,000. I'm not a fabrication shop. I really didn't need one of those. I think this thing was under $200. And it's a perfect solution for somebody that, like, needs to tap some holes maybe twice a year. And you don't want to do it with a tap wrench, but you can't justify, like, a ridiculously expensive professional tapping machine. This thing is a really nice in-between because it eliminates all the, all of my complaints with hand tapping. Uh, I've seen people do this in a drill press, too. Like, without the motor running, they just, like, pull down on the quill, and then just turn the thing by hand. That's that's all right. This thing is, you know, my general rule of thumb on all tools is if you have a tool and it's designed to do more than one thing, it usually sucks at all of those things. But if you have a tool and it only does one thing, it will do that one thing exceedingly well. And this machine is a good example of that. Like I said, it's been sitting on a fucking, it's been sitting on a shelf for two years. But when I need it, I'm glad to have it. So the whole idea of this machine is it's just, it's just a rotating cylinder with like uh, an arm, and then there's there's like a little aperture you can move down here to clamp your part. There's a through hole in the base plate for doing what I'm doing, tapping longer cylindrical things. Uh, this is a depth stop right here, and then there's a counterweight back here. The counterweight basically, if you push this down, it just it makes it very easy to lift back up. And the counterweight's adjustable based on how big of a tap or like how deep you're tapping. And it's just as simple as it, it's got this handle here for higher torque, this handle here for higher speed, lower torque. Um, in the back, there's several different, there's collets you can change for different size taps. Um, fun fact, number 1224, very weird size tap. It didn't come with a collet for it, so I had to make my own. Or I had to, alt actually, I just had to modify the, the tap. Had to grind down the shank of the tap itself to fit. Um, and it's it's really just it's that it's really just as simple as a rotating shaft with a collet in the end that can receive the tap. 
<clears throat> and it it's, works a treat. It works quite well. Like I can, you know, I can run this tap down in here in a matter of, I don't know, 50 seconds or a minute. And that is, if I was doing this by hand, this would be, this would be just awful. And then once you get it all the way to the bottom like that, you just run it in slow. You saw me back off a couple of times there. When you're cutting threads, as you're cutting, you're creating a chip inside the hole. And what you need to do is you need to rotate down for a certain amount of time, and then you need to go backwards for just a short spin. When you go backwards like that, it breaks off that chip and lets it fall down so that you're not continually increasing the amount of friction as you're cutting the, the threads. But that's it. That side's donezo. There's a bunch of little metal chips. It's always astonishing to me how much actual metal chips it makes when you're cutting a thread like that. Like I turn this thing over and I tap it. And it's, oh, there's a lot of metal that falls out of there. But that's all there is to it. So like every lug, I like to just uh, I blow off the chips from the previous hole. I have a little container with oil and a, just a cheap brush here. Blowing outside. Put a little bit of oil on here. And then all you got to do is, uh, I've already pre-chamfered all of these holes in here, which is really important to get the tap lined up. You just poke that thing in the end, just a slight amount of down pressure to get the tap to start itself. Right at the beginning is pretty critical. You want to do a couple of, at the beginning I'll do a couple of rotations and then I'll back off a little bit. But then once you got the tap kind of aligned to the hole and it's starting the threads basically align itself to the hole. Then you can kind of just go for broke here. Like I'll go like 10, 20 rotations. And you can really feel it in the friction. Like if you feel a, a sudden increase in friction, right there was one. That means you've you've cut enough metal that you need to take a little pause and back off like that. And I just, uh, I was trying to use the depth stop on this machine when I when I started, but realistically, I kind of, I've been ignoring it, and I'm just, what I do is I just run this thing down until the, until I run out of tap, basically, until I bottom the tap out in the hole. That seems to work pretty well. And then once you bottom the tap out, you can just spin this thing out, and it just unscrews itself. Really easy to spin. It's got a grease fitting on it on the side that you can't see here to keep it nice and lubricated. And it's, it's cool because it has that counterweight, and the counterweight has like a little, there's a little bearing here that spins on this circular collar. So it just kind of pulls itself out almost. And that's it. Tap pull. I'm very excited to be. This was the last one. That was the last one. I'm very excited about that being the last one. I've been working on these for about two weeks tapping or drilling and tapping all of these holes. Not all at the same time. I've mainly been doing other stuff, but starting about two weeks ago, I've had my lathe set up with like a, to drill all the holes. And if I had a spare seven minutes, I would just do one hole real quick. I just finished all of the hole drilling, which took the lion's share of the time. I finished that the other day. And just this morning, I went over there and I cleaned up all of the, the metal chips by the lathe, put away all the bullshit associated with doing that job. And I'm very much looking forward to cleaning up all of this bullshit. The funny thing is, though, I'm going to, the next step I have is I had to cover all of these in blue painter's tape just to protect them. And the next thing I'm going to have to do is just, uh, I'm going to have to take all that painter's tape off, every single lug, which isn't going to be easy because I've been using all this oil and WD-40, so the tape's kind of like the, the adhesive's a little melted. So I'm going to have to pick all this tape off, and then I'm going to have to clean all of these lugs with mineral spirits to get any tape residue off. 
and then I'm gonna have to reassemble all of the lugs with their uh, their base plates. And then, finally, they will ready. They'll be ready to go on the drum set. The drum set that these go to is really cool. It's a it's a solid Babinga stave kit. It's a 8, 10, 12, 14, 16 tongs. Uh, 14 and 16 being four tongs. And then it has two kick drums. It has a, an 18 and a 20 inch kick drum. And it's gonna be it's gonna be probably right up there with one of the coolest drum sets I think that I've ever built. I'm very excited. This is gonna be so fucking neat to have a full size Babinga stave kit like that. It's gonna be I can't even wait to play it. It's gonna be fucking awesome. I find myself oddly excited about the eight inch tom. I don't know why, but when I was playing a lot back in the day I never had an eight inch tom. I always had a ten and a twelve, thirteen, something like that. I fucking love eight inch toms. They're very fun to play. I'm covered in metal shaving. Oh, man. Okay. Uh, well, I appreciate you guys swinging by. I know that was long and boring, but if it was long and boring for you, can you only imagine how terrible it was for me? Pretty terrible. But uh, all the lugs are tapped. I assume that nobody wants to watch me clean these fucking things, so I'm going to go ahead and end this live stream and go clean some of these lugs. But I do appreciate you guys swinging by. That was a fun time. I'm going to try to do more of these. Keep your eyes peeled. I'll be around. See you guys. Thanks.